Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Douglas Laboratories Educational Webinar Series. My name is Kathleen Shevney, and I'm a Territory Manager in the Midwest. I'd like to thank everyone on the line for joining us today. Today's webinar is about estrogen dominance, aromatase inhibition, and preservation of testosterone presented by Dr. Joseph Collins. Dr. Collins will hold off and answer questions at the end of the webinar presentation, but you are able to submit questions at any time through the Go To toolbar, which is located at the right side of your screen. I'd like to share a little background on Dr. Collins. Dr. Joseph J. Collins is an internationally recognized leader in the field of functional endocrinology. He is an experienced medical educator and presents many lectures to physicians, pharmacists, nurse practitioners, and other healthcare practitioners on diagnostic and therapeutic applications within the integrated functional medicine model. Dr. Joseph Collins is licensed by the state of Washington as a primary healthcare naturopathic physician. He is a graduate of National College of Naturopathic Medicine in Portland, Oregon, and he is the co-founder of YourHomeHormones.com. With attention to highly individualized care, Dr. Collins's protocols are available on his website, YourHormones.com, for professional health care professionals who use natural and integrative therapies. His customized therapies include a focus on functional medicine as a primary approach to menopause, andropause, adrenal fatigue, thyroid dysfunction, insulin resistance, and fatigue disorders. Dr. Collins is a clinical advisor, researcher, and developer of seven hormone-specific formulas which are available through Douglas Laboratories. Thank you, Dr. Collins, for being with us today. And at this point, we will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Kathleen. It's an honor to be with, um, give this presentation again with, with uh, Douglas Laboratories. We have a lot of material to cover today. I think we're all concerned about the problems and the worries that our patients have about estrogen dominance and uh, imbalances in their hormone metabolism and function. I, in the past, we've covered a lot of this material in the webinar on women's health and on men's health. So I'm not going to go over some of the real specific detail that I went over in those two webinars again. I will occasionally flash up a slide to kind of bring to remembrance what you've seen on those previous slides. But I won't spend much time on those. Uh, but I will advise you that if you need to go back and review many of the women's health and men's health conditions that I'll be um, re making reference to today, the greater detail is on those other two webinars. Okay, so we're going to talk about estrogen dominance, aromatase inhibition, and preservation of testosterone. That preservation of testosterone uh, is probably getting some of your attention because you're wondering, why does that have to do with the aromatase inhibition? The reason I was concerned about that is because I saw um, different formulations out there that people were using that were supposed to help get aromatase, but they also they work by basically blocking testosterone production and then of course with low testosterone you have less estrogen. So if you look at the estrogen it was lower but also was lower in the testosterone as well. And then I also noticed different, um, different herbs have properties that I have, well all herbs have multiple facets to them. And if we don't look at all the multiple facets we may get ourselves in trouble. For instance, you'll hear me mention this briefly throughout this is fenugreek extracts are being promoted as helping with male athletic activity, but they actually raise estradiol levels in men higher than they raise testosterone levels in men. And some of the male patients I know they're taking those are a little unhappy when they're noticing that. Um, that um, fenugreek is best for women's health. I think you'll see um, the wiser physicians are using it for that. Well, the ones of us that are reading the redundant research out there. There's a lot of research on that. Okay, so next is, oops, wrong button there. Uh, okay, I'm trying to remember how to get this thing to click. I made a mistake here, hold on. Doo -doo -doo. Uh, okay, hold on a second, I'm having trouble figuring out how to get this thing to go to the next slide. Oh, 
Okay, I got it now. Okay. Okay, something happened here. Uh, no, no drive mode. Okay. Okay, here we go. Boy, excuse me, I hit the wrong button at one time there. <laughs> okay, so that's a little disclaimer that you could all read your leisure. <laughs> You've seen them all before. Most of the important point, I've been doing this for a while, 1979, so I'm kind of in that old group. Um, speaker bio, you heard about that already. Now, here's a quick review of the um, webinar intentions. We're going to just briefly touch on the steroid pathway periodically. We're going to make sure we understand how estrogen is produced and what aromatase actually does. And we're going to learn to identify some of the history and some of the um, new ideas about estrogen dominance and also why androgen is involved in that. And then we're also going to learn some clinical applications for diet, lifestyle, and the file therapeutic use of the formulation Estroquench, which was designed to uh, be a herbal aromatase inhibitor that also maintains testosterone function and why the testosterone function is critically important. This is the steroid hormone pathway that we're all familiar with. We've seen many different versions of this come throughout the years. And one of the things I've observed is some of the versions are starting to sneak inside metabolites, okay? Like, this, you know, this was taken from a version off of the internet you may recognize, but they actually added estriol on there. Well, estriol is not part of the primary steroid pathway. It's a metabolite. And as is DHT is a metabolite. So I kind of clean this up to just say, here are the hormones we talk about. Metabolites are a different conversation. And we can have that conversation. But before we do that, a quick review is, if you look at the cholesterol molecule, you'll see that you have the, the A ring over here, then the B ring, C and D. And those rings are actually um, numbered, uh, you know, given that thing to help you understand the position. But even more importantly, each of the carbons are, are numbered as well. So we have, you know, carbon number two, we, we have the two hydroxyestrogens. Carbon 16 is where you see the 16, et cetera. So then we can understand why we have the different names of the estrogen or angio metabolites. Estrogen detoxification is something, of course, we're, we're very concerned about. If you look at this graph, you'll see that estradiol on the, on the um, lower left-hand side of, of the screen, and then you have estrone right above it. Those, if they go down, they go down 16 hydroxylation pathway, and those create the 16 of the bad estrogens. If they go up on the 2 hydroxylation pathway, you have 2 hydroxys, and then, of course, if you methylate the um, 2 hydroxys, you get the 2 methyl um, metabolites. Of course, this graph doesn't even show the most important one, which is the, uh, you know, for, uh, another important group, which is the 4 hydroxys, but I measure those as well. I think we're all looking at that now as well. This is an old slide I showed years ago about um, how 2 hydroxys are are good, the bad 16 alphas, and the 4s are by using methylation. And I use dim enhance to drive the estrogens toward 2 hydroxylation, then I use like B-complex, metafolin, intrinsic factor to methylate the 2 hydroxys to create 2 methoxy estrogens. And for the case of review, the 2 methoxy estrogens are not only non-cancerous, they're anti-cancer. 2 methoxy estradiol will cause apoptosis of cancer cells. So if we get this right, we can actually create our own chemotherapy with less side effects, okay, <laughs> or none. Here's some of the anti metabolites that are uh, being looked at more and more in, in diagnostic testing. This is from a urine test. We have the etiocholinone, um, the, androstena, the androsterone, and the different um, androstenediol uh, metabolites of um, both 5-alpha and 5-beta DHT. Uh, the significance of these is going to be interesting to uh, reveal. Hormone signaling review. We know that hormones are basically just messengers. If we're really honest, we have to recognize that the endocrine system also has messengers, but we don't call them hormones, we call them cytokines. The nervous system also has messages that go throughout the body. Uh, we just call them neurotransmitters. So even though hormones are given the distinction of saying, well, for instance, it's a cell receives a message from a distant cell. Uh, we understand there are other cell signal mechanisms of the body, but this one obviously is focused on hormones. Endocrine means I produce hormones in one part of the body that affects cells in a distant part, such as uh, a man will create testosterone in his 
testicles and they will, it will affect his brain and muscles and other tissues. Paracrin means that a local cell will excrete hormones that will affect nearby cells. This is seen um, pathologically in many forms of cancer cells. Um, and then autocrine means this uh, cell basically gives a message to itself. This is noticed uh, essentially in the production of estrogens and androgens in the brain where we can actually do autocrine activity to upregulate uh, some of the, what we look at as gonadal hormones, we actually makes trace amount within the skull itself. Same progesterone, obviously. Phytocrine is a word I made up uh, <laughs> years ago to describe the fact that cells actually receive messages from plant sources. We now recognize, as we've discussed in earlier presentations, is that constituents of plants actually interact with cell receptors, cell DNA, messenger RNA. They are acting just like hormones, so there's phytocrine, the sources from the plant. What are we worried about? We're worried about aromatase, and to understand that, we want to first make it very clear we know what it does. Aromatase has one activity. is to catalyze the transformation of the C19 androgens, so those are the um, steroid hormones that have 19 carbons, into the aromatic C18 estrogens. You can see the aromatic ring in the estrogens. The androgens do not have it. There are no aromatic rings in the steroid pathway until after estrogen. So aromatase is the, the big change that um, converts androgens to estrogens and it specifically converts androstenedione into estrone and testosterone to estradiol. All other um, estrogens are metabolized of these primary hormones. This is our friend aromatase. It's a pretty huge molecule. If you look real close, you'll see in the middle a little red dot with a little gray squiggly thing above that. That is actually the heme proximal cavity. Uh, aromatase has a lot of different cavities inside of it. It's a big three-dimensional molecule. As we understand from hemoglobin, the heme molecule is very reactive and able to manipulate and switch back and forth ions and, and you know, cellular structure, etc. And so that's what it does here. That gray structure is actually either anisinidione or testosterone, and the heme proximal cavity is going to manipulate that and aromatize it and turn to either estrone or estradiol. Why do we want aromatase inhibition? We want to increase the PDE ratio in women. Now yes, we've done that over the years. We got real excited about progesterone in the 90s and first decade of this century. Uh, but the problem is when we're only using progesterone to correct low PDE, it has its limitations because progesterone is a precursor for estrogen first and foremost. So if a woman is predisposed towards excessive aromatase activity and we give more progesterone and then she starts to get the nostalgia and some of the other symptoms that we go, whoa, that's, that's supposed to have gone away, it's because we were actually giving her more substrate and she was making more estrogen, exactly what we did not want to happen. And also we want to be very clear on the fact that progesterone is not an aromatase inhibitor. Even though in the 90s um, progesterone was able to secure everything including global warming, um, we realize it doesn't do that. It has its limitations. It is not a aromatase inhibitor, and it can actually make um, the PD ratio worse if we're dealing with a patient who's already an over-aromatizer. The same with men, and we're seeing this now because there's more and more attention being given to male health and testosterone replacement therapy. When we give only testosterone to correct a low TD ratio in men, testosterone is a really close precursor of estrogen. If you read the literature talking about testosterone replacement therapy, one of the side effects that is well recognized is that uh, gynecomastia and the TD and men start to make in too many estrogens, especially if a male has 20 pounds or more of excess body weight, which is unfortunately most of the gentlemen that go after this product because they, you know, that's part of the problem. Obesity causes um, low testosterone, et cetera. So, that's what we want to do. We want to, we want to fix the PD and TD ratio, but we don't want to keep giving estrogen or testosterone because it's kind of backfired on us. So what is the objective of aromatase inhibition? It is to decrease the production of estrogens without decreasing the production of other steroid hormones such as testosterone and progesterone. So um, we want to knock down the estrogens, but we want to you know, leave the progesterone and testosterone alone. 
to talk about aromatase inhibitors, we have to recognize that there's a lot of good literature coming from the pharmaceutical industry, and this gives some insights into how these aromatase inhibitors work. Uh, in fact, most of us think of aromatase inhibitors as primary pharmacological agents. Uh, there's two types. Type 1 is exemestane. Now, when I first saw exemestane years ago, I said, wait a second, that's, that's a hormone. Because if you look at the molecule, it looks like an, an androgen metabolite. And I thought it was androstane diol, um, you know, one of the metabolites, and it wasn't. What they did, I'm not saying what they did, or what it appears happened is that someone took an androgen metabolite and they move the hydrogen from one place to the other, and it now that binds to permanently to the aromatase heme site, and it basically is known as a suicide aromatase inactivator. So androgen metabolite type molecules will bind to the heme cavity of aromatase, and they'll attach themselves, and they won't let go because, you know, they, they basically neutralize that that one um, mo molecule of aromatase, and now we have less aromatase activity. Those are suicide aromatase inhibitors. Type 2 are such as um, anestrozole and letrozole. Those are non steroidal and the action is reversible. So you've got to keep those um, you know, going regularly, and they, they can be displaced by estrogen. That's one of the limitations of those, is that they can be displaced. It, you know, Once they leave the aromatase site, the estrogen can jump in there. So they have to be kept in pretty high dosages to compete with um, estrogens, the substrate, whereas the first ones will actually permanently knock out each molecule. This is what I found fascinating in doing my research. I didn't know this, you know, until I started going over and over again, like, what can we do to affect aromatase function? And then I found some fascinating information here. C specific, not all of them, but specific C19 androgen metabolites actually have aromatase inhibition activity. Okay, a show of hands. How many of you didn't know that? All right, I, I see those few hands. Thanks for sharing that. Um, the reality is here is that one of the reasons that we're seeing the problem with men as we age is as our testosterone drops, our androgen metabolites drop, and those androgen metabolites were keeping the ester, the aromatase in check. Now, these are some of the references there. I think we're going to see a lot more. And again, look at the uh, XMS tank. We realize that C19 androgen metabolites and similar molecules actually act as aromatase inhibitors, and some of them quite powerfully. They're actually comparing them to uh, pharmaceutical aromatase inhibitors. So we want to make sure that when we do aromatase inhibition, we do not want to knock out the testosterone. So now that we know that androgen metabolites function naturally as endogenous aromatase inhibitors. And that's a new concept. We have endogenous aromatase inhibitors. Um, one of the goals of ester is to support the production of these endogenous inhibitors. This is best established by maintaining androgen production function. And when I looked through that literature and, and experimented with different herbs to, to make sure that I was able to maintain, you know, the feeling of good testosterone without just knocking out estrogens, I found the Ericoma longifolia has been documented to both support testosterone function and has aromatase inhibitor activity in humans. So this is one of the herbs, of course, I've been using to uh, decrease estrogen production while maintaining the anti-estrogen or androgens. Uh, another endogenous aromatase inhibitor that we probably already have known about for many, many years is melatonin. This is pretty much well known. And we give really high doses of that to women that need aromatase inhibition naturally. The problem is, you know, you give them at the really high doses, just 10, 20, 30 milligrams, and they get a little sleepy, you know. Some of them can start to tolerate that after a point in time, but most of them, you know, they have the side effect of what melatonin does. Um, I still advise patients to take, an, you know, estoquench as a natural aromatase inhibitor or to get a, a little aromatase activity. They can take one to three of melatonin depending upon what they can tolerate, sometimes three milligrams to get the melatonin hangover. Many of them like the one milligram, the women. And uh, I also like aromatase because it is cardioprotective and it's a very strong antioxidant. So there's a lot of good reasons to supplement with melatonin unless you're absolutely positive that the patient has plenty of melatonin. Its cardioprotective properties are uh, of greatest benefit because, you know, um, the greatest risk of you know, cardiac problems can happen in, in night, especially if there's undiagnosed sleep apnea. Okay. 
Um, dietary aromatase inhibitors, I think we're familiar with many of those, such as apigenin and chrysin, and the flavonones such as narangenin and hesperitin, those will be discussed. Those all have significant aromatase inhibitor activity. The limitation is that we have to make sure that we give the patients pretty high dosages of um, those substances. You, you know, they have to eat a lot of the food. So uh, we use very concentrated uh, extracts to accomplish that. Oops, so that, uh, what happened there? Da, 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 da. Okay, I just changed the driver, um, the mouse here a little bit, excuse me. Okay, uh, go back up one. Okay, um, of interest, eight of the 11 ingredients in F-sequence are actually highly, um, plant, highly concentrated plant constituents that are used as food by various cultures. I got two of those words backwards, I'll have to address that. So these are pretty safe um, substances, they're just in really high concentrations. Excuse that little thing there while I try and tell it to quit. I don't know what that's all about. Ah, that's embarrassing. Okay. I hate when that happens. Apparently I downloaded a new mouse driver. Okay. <laughs> you all got to see it happen. Okay, these are the file therapeutic aromatase inhibitors. These are the plants that have documented aromatase activity in peer-reviewed published literature. There's a lot of folklore about plants aromatase inhibitors. These are the ones I found that are documented. These are aromatase inhibitor adjuvants. These uh, plants that help the aromatase inhibitors work a little better. I added Lepidium medii for a number of reasons. Um, one is it's a good way to help metabolize what estrogens are already in the body. We're going to stop making estrogens, but we want to also help metabolize them. Uh, and as we know, the um, glucosinates are the precursor for indole-3 carbon. Now, once you take glucosinates, you convert to I3C. I like I3C a little better than DIM because DIM has anti-androgen properties. So I will use DIM as well with this formulation, but I have to keep an eye on the fact that you know it, it may slightly interfere with androgen activity. So in the primary formula, though, I want to use I3C precursors instead of DIM. Also very important is Lepidium medii also has some, not a lot, but a couple of articles talk about how it can reduce cortisol elevations. That's important because increased levels of glucocorticoids such as cortisol and, and other um, um, cortisone and other glucocorticoids can cause increased aromatase activity. Again, too much cortisol causes aromatase upregulation. Uh, Biopurin, which is the plant extract of uh, piperine from the pepper, from you know regular pepper, that increases the absorption of the various flavones, and um, uh, to help them absorb more readily, that in the formulation it also reduces stress-induced response of corticosterone. Again, that also assists with prevention corticoid upregulation of aromatase. And as you know, the word adjuvant is basically means a drug or agent that helps another drug or agent enhance its medical effectiveness. So they are basically helpers. You have other properties as well, which you'll see. So estrogen dominance. What's this estrogen dominance all about? Okay. The phrase estrogen dominance had become very popularized in the 1990s when more attention was being given to progesterone. We basically were a progesterone ignorant society based upon our current understanding of today. In 90s was the real time of awakening to pay more attention to progesterone and not just estrogen in women's health and now extending to men's health as well. We need to keep in mind though that there is natural estrogen dominance in the estrus or arbitrary cycle of the menstrual cycle of both animals and humans respectively. So there is a period of estrogen dominance. The body doesn't freak out if there's a little more estrogen than progesterone relationship periodically. It's that when they get stuck in that mode we get in trouble. Uh, we also recognize the literature talking an awful lot about atrogenic or medically caused estrogen dominance. That's occurred because of combinations of, um, of specific combination oral contraceptives. Much of that's been because some of these progestogens, these synthetic progesterones are used in birth control pills and even medoxyprogesterone acetate given menopause, they actually suppress adrenal production of progesterone. So we were actually inducing a low progesterone state with some of these synthetic progestogens. Um, again, this here is a summary of everything I could find on the topic of estrogen dominance, that phrase in the medical literature. Estrogen dominance we know now can be quantified by evaluating the progesterone to estradiol ratio mathematically. 
Um, okay, so these are some of the conditions that we recognize that a low PD ratio or estrogen dominance is associated with or exacerbates. It, it may not have caused it, it may just make them worse um, of these conditions. Now we recognize that it isn't just the PD ratio or the estrogen dominance that we're dealing with here. If these patients are predisposed towards pro-inflammatory diets that are low in essential fatty acids, etc., um, or they have a lot of cytokine activity because of other chronic inflammation, viruses, etc., um, Lyme disease, whatever, then um, those need to be addressed as well. So I'm not saying that this is the singular thing, I think we all know that, but this is one of the objectives that, is to, that we can help by addressing the uh, excess estrogen activity. Fibrocystic breast disease, endometriosis, uh, ovarian cancer, mammary dysplasia, and risk for breast cancer, uh, menopause associated various symptoms are because of the uh, estrogen becoming more dominant because the progesterone is dropping. Um, and also, you know, sometimes the, you know, increased body fat is making relatively high, is still making estrogen while, the, while we're seeing less central um, ovarian production of progesterone or adrenal production of progesterone. So in a woman who's overweight, she may be able to maintain estrogen levels, but her adrenal glands and ovaries are no longer doing that. So we saw, start to see the, the weird PD ratio and estrogen dominance manifest in some types of menopause. Again, there are different types of menopause, as we've discussed in the past. And the same can occur with PMS symptoms, premenstrual symptoms, um, based upon a relative excess of estrogen compared to uh, estrogen, uh, progesterone and or testosterone. Quick review from the previous um, presentations we've given is just remember that when you're evaluating the progesterone to estradiol ratio, you want to convert the molecules into moles. Okay, like for instance, this is one on saliva testing, and what you can see at the top is that um, you know progesterone in the follicular phase is normally 21 to 147 from this lab in picograms per mole, which would be um, 66 to you know six. 467 in picomoles, and, and then you can compare down here the follicular estradiol would be like 1 to 12 picograms, and the it would be like 3.6 to 44 picomoles. What's interesting, if you look real close, is the molecular weight of progesterone is 314, but the molecular weight of estradiol is 272. So it's like trying to compare like a pound of oranges to a pound of grapes, you're going to have, well not quite that size, but you understand, you're going to have a different number of molecules even though they have the same weight. So picograms, nanograms, anytime you hear the word grams, you're talking about gravimetric testing, whereas when you look at that moles, we're talking about molar units, and that's what we want to do, we want to look at the actual number of molecules. If we go by picograms, we're going to have a 15% error, compared, uh, if we use, um, um, you know, gravimetric instead of using molar. Estrogen dominance in men. Now, this is interesting. When you hear of estrogen dominance, we think of a low PD ratio. But the first published paper that described estrogen dominance was in 1981, in which the author noted estrogen dominance with an elevated estrogen to test testosterone ratio, estrogen to testosterone ratio, okay. <laughs> Uh, can be seen in any testicular neoplasm and may result in gynecomastia. It may be due to a decrease in circulating testosterone or to an increase in estrogens. So, low TD ratio is the original estrogen dominance first identified in men. A low testosterone to estradiol ratio is also associated with gynecomastia as, pre as mentioned in that uh, testicular cancer paper. Infertility, depression, insulin resistance that can cause diabetes, sexual dysfunction, and you know, and all the symptoms that come with this—the fatigue, the, the low productivity, the dyscognia—all these things that happen when testosterone levels drop um, can be happen with a low TDE ratio in men. Now, this is a, what, very significant because in men, you know, we normally have higher testosterone relative to estrogen as we age or as we gain weight. The testosterone progressively drops while the estrogen rises and we get in trouble real quick with a um, low TDE ratio. Again, if you look at the ratio analysis, you want to make sure we convert to moles. There's a 16% error if you calculate based upon gravimetric or picogram units. Um, so that's, uh, when you look at this, you can see the lower right-hand corner, 
there's a hyperlink to uh, a conversion factor table from the American Medical Association, so you know it's pretty um, conservative, and it'll basically tell us how to convert anything from pi picograms to picomoles or, or you know, gravimetric to um, molar units. Here's an interesting case. I was talking with Dr. Mark Newman from um, um, Precision Hormones, a, a lab that does a very unique style of urinary hormone testing. And what we find here is we're going. We're talking about this case that he had, where a, a man, 50-year-old man, around 50s, a body mass index of 33. As you know, the normal body mass index is 18.5 to 24.9. And if you look in the, you know, the left-hand side of the screen, the white part, those are the androgens and androgen metabolites. And you can actually see that uh, his DHEA, his testosterone was low. All of his androgen metabolites are low. Basically, the guy was, you know pretty much androgen deficient, okay? So like, where do all these go? Well, then you look over here to the right-hand side, and you can see that all of, he didn't have many of the androgens because they were all being converted to estrogens. Look at that. His estrone, his estradiol, his estriol are all, some of them, off the board. And unfortunately, and look at his 16. is a, is past the high end of normal. And unfortunately, even though he's real good at making estrogens, he wasn't even able to make enough of the two hydroxy estrogens. So this gentleman was obviously in need of some aggressive aromatase inhibition. He needs to quit making estrogen and he needs to be able to preserve his testosterone. This is the type of gentleman that this formation was designed for. I've been seeing too many men, even in their 40s, that have a TD ratio like this. They're very um, truly estrogen dominant. Remember, that their original estrogen dominance was in men. And this is a classic example of that. Here's another interesting case, and if you look at it closely, you go, oh, wow, his testosterone's fine. In fact, it's, look at 68.1, the normal range goes up to 74, so he's, he's in, uh, you know, he's, quote, normal. So just looking at testosterone in men is, what's that word? Oh, yeah, worthless, yeah. We need to also look at the other estrogens. If you look at his estradiol, which is the classic way of looking at, obviously, the, the testosterone to estradiol ratio, if you look at his estradiol level, is high. So you're going to have still a low TD ratio. His estrogen is high compared to his testosterone, even though his testosterone is in normal ranges here. But I'm going, wait a second, how is this one possible? Uh, because he still has, quote, plenty of androgens and uh, plenty of androgen metabolites. And that's why when I, when I made this formulation, I said we need to also control cortisol because lo and behold, what did he have? Look at the graph down below there. High cortisol, three times the normal amount of cortisol. So it's important that we address, and of course, we do other things with this gentleman to help calm him down and relax his body and figure out why his cortisol is you know, enough for three people. But high cortisol in both genders upregulates aromatase. So even though he had plenty of testosterone, he had even more estrogen. He's low TD ratio with high cortisol. That's why in the ester quench, I like to have a number of the herbs actually um, inhibit the stress-induced rise in cortisol and corticosterone. So here's my goal. I want to, how do I put this formulation together for these guys and, and also for women that needed estrogen decrease? Now we talk about some case in men, but obviously in women, when they have the fibrocystic breast and the different types of precancerous or cancerous conditions, we want to knock the estrogens down really quick. The best way to do that is to quit making them. Now I like DIM. I've been using DIM and DIM Enhanced for a long time. Um, but instead of trying to break up and destroy the estrogens after they've been made, I want to stop making them. So this is why someone asked me, why, what's the difference between DIM and estroquench? Well, estroquench stops the production of estrogens, whereas DIM can, you know, facilitate the breakdown of the estrogens that also exist, and they are compatible to use together. Just keep in mind that you want to watch the androgens if that's a concern in that particular patient. So number one, I want to have some aromatase inhibition, and I want to be redundant inhibition because the literature says that singularly the different flavones and flavanones are not as effective as multiple flavones and flavanones. And this is also, let's be honest, most of us have seen this. Multiple agents, even going back to ancient Chinese and Ayurvedic and, and um, you know, um, other parts of the world, medicine, multiple agents are more effective than one. So I want redundant aromatase inhibition. Since these high estrogen can cause um, proliferative and um, you know cancerous conditions, 
I wanted to have anti-proliferative and pro-apoptotic. Basically, I want to cause apoptosis. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. As you know, cancer cells are, unfortunately, a little more immoral than we'd like them to be. They don't die when they're supposed to. So I wanted plants that documented to tell these uh, renegade cells to die. I want some documented ability to protect the prostate and the breast. I want to see these herbs documented to be able to, at least a few of them, help me maintain a little bit of testosterone and other androgens. Now, of course, I can also give test again as well if I really want to keep the testosterone up. A little glucocorticoid control, and you can also use, um, uh, what do you call it, um, adrenamend, <laughs> what do you call it, adrenamend with that as well, the other formulation I designed. And I want to make sure that we at least did something to contribute to healthy estrogen metabolism, a little bit of endol 3 carbon while we're at it. And since everyone wants to have a good sex, I said, let's make sure these herbs also support sexual function. I didn't want to knock out quality of life issues as I was trying to attain the goal of aromatase inhibition. So that's a nice add a little bonus there. Now in the past, some of you have seen I'd go through each herb and I'd spend like, you know, all and on and on on detail of each one. That information is, is going to be available on the website, yourhormones.com, and Douglas Laboratories already has a fantastic product data sheet on it that gives you some of the specific days of each herb. And get on my newsletter, we'll keep you updated with new revelations of what these herbs are doing. But this is a nice way of looking at them. Look at the first column after the names of the herbs. Nine of the 11 herbs have documented aromatase inhibiting activity. Nine of them are anti-proliferative. Eight of them cause cancer cell death. Uh, a number of them help the prostate and the breast. Uh, a number of them help with sex, you know, a few of them help with sexual function. A few of them help with um, cortisol control. Uh, Urocomia longifolia is actually more popular for increasing testosterone than it is a aromatase inhibitor. And, and an interesting story is I, I, I have patients on test again and I start to notice that some of them, not only was the testosterone getting better, but the estrogen was actually getting a little lower. And I thought, well, that's because they're making more testosterone. But some of them actually had a little bit of extra tissue on them, a little more obesity. And I thought, wow, were they, why are they not aromatized? And I realized Enrocomia longifolia, as well as helping them make testosterone, has aromatase inhibiting activities. So part of estroquench was like a, almost like a, um, my journey has been like 10 years to put this together, but some of the revelations have come by watching what Testagain has done as far as being able to raise testosterone uh, and in, in some cases not actually lower estrogen. Not every case, but some cases. Um, some of the earth's been documented to maintain DHEA. We, also, we mentioned that um, one of them helps metabolize estrogen and most of the herbs actually are foods, are very, very, very highly concentrated food extracts. These are supplement facts you can be in any bottle of estroquench. And I like to show the, how beautiful these plants are. I mean, this is an amazing creation. We can see that most of these are things you may actually see on your dinner table or sitting out by the pool. I mentioned that because I just moved to Florida. And um, they're really quite beautiful plants. And these are the plants that supply us with the constituents that we need to have aggressive aromatase inhibition. They have been designed to work synergistically together, not oppose each other. There are a lot of plants out there that are kind of in the, uh, you know, consideration stage, like, oh, maybe this should be good or that, but some of them had properties that did not fit into our ultimate goal of, of aromatase inhibition without other side effects or without knocking out testosterone. As I said earlier, you can knock down estrogen, but you want to keep, you don't want to knock down testosterone as well. So the goal is not total castration. The goal is um, just knock down the aromatase, okay? One of the things I want to share with you, if you go to yourhormones.com and if you look at the left-hand side of the screen links, you see at the bottom is something that says uh, resources. That page actually looks different now. Uh, we've just updated it again today, and that includes the product data sheets. It will have the extra quench one down very quickly. We're still doing final edits on that, the typos I keep doing. And we also added a, um, another guide on there you'll find beneficial. As far as dosage guidelines, when you use estroquench, we use the 242 protocol, which I think many of you are familiar with. Um, you start the patient with two capsules, one to two weeks, then increase to four, and when they come back in the lab says they're doing great, you want to wean them back down to two. The goal is not to have them on high dose forever, but the high dose of four days is what will push them through the resistance, and then maintenance is able to maintain them where they want to be the rest of their lives. Some even get down to one, to be quite honest. On all my formulations, 
we're seeing more and more patients once they get the test again or the adrenal end, the thyroid end to repair their function, many of them are going down to one, so we have to update that literature as well, obviously. Adjuvant formulas, you can use it with test again. Use estramen as to quench with test again to um, increase the TD ratio more quickly. Use estroquench or progestamin to increase the PD ratio more quickly because obviously as well as lowering the estrogen, you can either raise the testosterone or the progesterone. And I use it with dim enhance, as I mentioned. If I really want to do some aggressive um, estrogen um, reduction, this will t really help lower the total estrogen burden very quickly in those patients that have malignant or pre-malignant and, and even like um, prostate conditions, et cetera. Um, all the formulations are compatible except for one. Testagain and progestamin are uh, compatible, as I said. Estamend is actually very compatible. Keep in mind that estamend was not formulated to raise estrogen. It was formulated for women that have menopause deficiency symptoms but had a cancer history, so were afraid of raising estrogen levels, or women who were on estrogen replacement therapy and still had symptoms, or women who did not want the estrogen levels high. So it, it basically uses mimetics, plants that act like estrogen, but do not have estrogen um, activities. For instance, um, Don Kwai increases vaginal lubrication, but it is not um, going to cause um, endometrial proliferation, etc. So it's, it's not designed to raise estradiol levels, so you can use that to get with that. Um, Thyramend, of course, and adrenamen, those can be beneficial with it. And testiquins for men, especially in men with prostate dysplasia, knock down the, um, this is when you would use that, you would want to knock down the testosterone with the estiquins to protect the prostate. You're going to override the, the, um, the one herb inside estiquins uh, to benefit the prostate. At this time, estiquins is not considered compatible. Uh, it's very important to keep in mind that both Peonia lactiflora and Trigonella um, fenugreek, uh, fenugreek are two herbs that have been documented in human studies to raise estradiol levels. Okay, I use the fenugreek in estroquench for women, be, uh, excuse me, in testiquench for women because women with PCOS often do better when we help with the estrogen to get up a little higher. Predominantly, uh, many PCOS patients have a problem with, um, you know, keeping the estrogen levels up. Um, and so we use that. So um, I can use dim enhanced with testicles for women if I want to help them get rid of the toxic estrogens, but many of them need some um, estrogen support, some you know biologically active uh, estrogen. And also I typically use um, progesterone with PCOS as well. There's a whole PCOS protocol on the website, and we can talk about that when you look at the other uh, old websites webinars as well. Also, let's remember the lifestyle. The patients don't want to just take pills and potions and powders. They want us to say, well, what can I eat? What can I do this different? Download, this is just showing a little piece of the estrogen metabolism diet. Go to the link that says diets and hormones. Find the one that says uh, estrogen metabolism. Download the PDF and share that with your patients and um, so they can see that we give them more than um, just the supplements. We can make a big change in the diet. And the more we fill them up with fruits and vegetables, the less they're going to buy junk food. <laughs> I'm going to go real briefly through a number of different um, protocols of how to use estroquench in some very specific conditions. We're not going to go at great length of each of these because what we've done this morning is we've downloaded this guide. You can see called uh, Healthcare Professionals Guide to Protocols for Hormone Specific Formulations. This is the first edition. It will be updated quarterly. And this one, base, this one to, fo, totally focuses on estroquench use in a number of conditions. Future editions will um, talk more and more about the other formulations, such as adrenamine, thyramine, testigain, et cetera. But this um, inaugural edition is dedicated to estroquench. And you can go to resources, as I mentioned earlier, that site's been updated. Estroquench for women's health can be used to treat all these different conditions we talked about earlier. In fibrocystic breasts, we've all observed that you need to calm down the estrogen and raise the progesterone. Um, you know, so we can use progesterone. You know, progesterone is very anti-inflammatory. So progesterone was designed to be very anti-inflammatory and anti-proliferative, etc. And by the way, estrogen also is very anti-proliferative. But also in fibrocystic breast disease, because we have so much inflammation, I, I always tell the patient. You know, you know, of course, fish oils and say, but women's iron plus is very important as well. So, you know, don't just play with the hormones. Calm down the inflammation system as well. 
Um, there's a high instance of hypothyroidism in these patients, so look at if thiamine is indicated, and if so, that's been helpful in some of the cases, uh, basically the ones that had hypothyroidism. And if we want to get some more aggressive reduction of the estrogen stimulation of the fibrosis of breast tissue, then you can use DIM enhanced. Um, as I said, the, the are compatible formulations. Just keep in mind that, you know, watch the testosterone and stuff like that. But usually that's not our biggest concern. We want to get rid of the fibrocystic pain. And um, once you get the diet cleaned up, we can wean them down to maintenance dosages and they'll be fine. Endometriosis is very similar. Um, you, I'm, I'm a little careful about trying to push progesterone too much because sometimes that backfires with endometriosis patients, but I do want aggressive uh, aromatase inhibition in them. Uh, and the literature substantiates that Wolbenzyme, absolutely. In fact, I've been giving Wolbenzyme a long time for endometriosis patients. It's amazing. Um, and obviously thyroid or dim enhanced if appropriate. Ovarian cancer, we're just talking about aggressive uh, estrogen, you know, total load, dropping it down as fast as we can. I put them on a double, you know, the full dose of estroquence, four capsules quite a day. I, I put them on a double dose of dim, <laughs> and I put them on, you know, a bigger dose of uh, Wobenzyme. And um, I know other clinicians are doing the same thing. Where you're doing, but we're getting a little more aggressive with people that are having these types of conditions. Um, high doses of aromatase inhibition of dim and high doses of Wobenzyme plus. Same with mammary dysplasia. dysplasia. Now these, of course, can be used as an adjuvant with other um, therapies for, for those of you that are very experienced in oncology and um, have IV therapies and some of the other um, uh, photoluminescence and other therapies that you're using for these patients. Um, Menopause-associated symptoms, you know, such as the irregular bleeding, the start having the endometrial hyperplasia, developing the pops and fibroids and the breast disturbances, mood disturbances, etc. Those have to be done um, based upon the specific type of menopause. Okay, as you know from my previous work, um, that's quite a bit old now. But, um, there's more than one type of menopause. Menopause can be based upon having adequate estrogen and progesterone, as you see in the upper left-hand corner, or just estrogen deficiency or just progesterone or dual deficiency, and compare that to either normal low or high testosterone. So there's actually 12 major archetypes of menopause. We call them menopause types. And menopause has to be treated based upon the individual needs of each patient, as we discussed in the past. It can show up many different ways. There's 12 major types or archetypes, and we treat one according to our type. So premenstrual symptoms is, uh, again, based upon the type of PMS. I did not discover the PMS types. Uh, uh, Dr. Abrams mentioned that years ago. And if indicated, thiamine or Wobenzyme. Wobenzyme seems to have quite a bit with some of these premenstrual patients, I think, because of these, as you know, inflammation is a common marker. But choose the formulation based upon what the patient's needs are. I should have actually put up here um, testoquence for women next, if um, as an alternative, because you're not always going to use estroquence in PMS. Sometimes you're going to use estromendous uh, uh, progesterone or something. This is Guy Abrams. He talked about the PMS type A, C, H, or D for anxiety, craving, hypertension, depression. And I stared at this little graph for years and I recognized, I know what looks familiar. You're looking at clusters of progesterone um, um, deficiency, androgen deficiency, estrogen deficiency. But the type H puzzled me for the longest time, and so I realized that um, increased testosterone raises aldosterone in women, so that's what was causing the hyperhydration type of PMS. And when I gave them testoquence for women, we started to see that PMS type H um, get better much faster. So um, again, Dr. Abrams um, put that together years ago when he was, um, and I kind of just added to it, give him the credit. Estrequential women's health, gynecomastia, infertility, sexual dysfunction, et cetera. We mentioned those. Obviously, gynecomastia, give them an estrequence. Knock the estrogen down right away. Um, if indicated, you know, you want to use some dim enhancing well enzyme, that can help really decrease the um, proliferation, the in, in, increased production of cells in that area, if you will, at this time. And I try to just focus on aggressive estrogen detox um, lowering in the beginning stages. And then after they get better, I'll talk about trying to get their um, testosterone back up. Uh, infertility, uh, we need to both get rid of the excess estrogen. There's so much literature that talks about too much estrogen in men is one of the biggest contributors to infertility. And at the same time, low testosterone. So you can use both of those. 
If, if indicated, or depending on how aggressive you want to be, you can use dim enhanced and um, Wobenzyme. Especially Wobenzyme can be looked at to decrease the antibodies if you're dealing with some autoimmune disease, maybe suspected. Um, men with celiac disease have a high incidence of infertility because they develop other endocrinopathies besides, you know, um, not just the celiac disease, they, which is not endocrinopathy. They have celiac disease associated with hypothyroidism um, because of antithyroid antibodies. They have anti um, testes antibodies. It's pretty um, bad out there. So make sure we keep an eye on that as well. Sexual dysfunction, as to quench test again, um, very um, effective and um, a lot of happy people out there now. Uh, if indicated, thiamine and amend, because, you know, remember, a lot of these patients have fatty thyroids and adrenal fatigue as well. Benign prostatitis, when I look at benign prostatitis, I'm getting a little more aggressive, uh, not just lowering the estrogen, but also, uh, at this point, lowering the testosterone as well, to be quite honest. So the test sequence for men is a very powerful anti-androgen formula. It's going to override the Uricoma longifolia, uh, which we have observed. And that's going to really shrink that uh, prostate down pretty quickly, especially when you hit it with some DIM and some Wobenzyme. I've talked with other um, uh, naturopathic physicians who have really found Wobenzyme to, you know, for years have been using that to shrink the prostate, and I found the same thing. But now with us manipulating the hormones, we're seeing that happen very quickly. Uh, malignant prostate disease, uh, basically the same idea except you just double the dose and get more aggressive. <laughs> okay. uh, depression, that's going to be pretty much the same thing of why a gentleman is like infertile or sexual dysfunction. Low testosterone, high estradiol, he's going to be depressed, he's going to have all these different disorders coming up on him. And so get the estrogen down, the testosterone up and evaluate thyroid and adrenal. Insulin resistance, um, the same thing, a low TD ratio is strongly associated with insulin resistance and diabetes type 2 in men. So TD ratio, if it doesn't make you infertile and potent, it will give you diabetes. So there's a lot of reasons to get that fixed, gentlemen. Uh, also, if indicated thyroid and adrenal mend, I use glucobium or berberine balance as well, and Wobenzyme uh, because of its ability to stop some of the inflammation. As you know, insulin resistance and hyperglycemia always has global systemic inflammation as a uh, congruent pathology, so I do that as well in those patients. Quick little side note from previous slide, you remember that high insulin can actually suppress testosterone production. In fact, if you just take a, you know, 75 grams of sugar, it'll knock your testosterone down 25%. Uh, it also suppresses not just testosterone, but the uh, central systems, the hypothalamic pituitary access. It will suppress LH and FSH. I do not like high doses of vanadium because it can also suppress FSH and LH and testosterone sperm count and it can also stress the HPA and you know make more cortisol. So vanadium as a trace element I think is fine, as a high dose I think is uh, not fine and that's based upon a lot of literature. I just showed one of the most scary examples in that one study. <laughs> I want to get together and put a nice list for you all about, okay, if your patient's on this medication, is estroquine safe for them? If they're on this medication, is this herb safe and that? And we'd have to sit down for a long time because there's so many medications out there and the information's constantly changing. So what I'm recommending is those of us who practice integrative healthcare and we have patients coming to us on pharmacological agents as well. I'm not getting any endorsements from these these guys. I haven't even talked to nat natural standards yet. Maybe I should get a kickback for this. I don't know. But <laughs> but uh, I'm just going to recommend them because I like them a lot. If I have a patient that's on a medication, I double check to see what's been documented in the literature and they are really pretty up to date on what they're offering. Um, here's an example. I looked up uh, Lipidium AI. This is actually a screenshot. And when I click on the precautions and contraindication, the left hand column link there, it says to use it cautiously with anticoagulant therapy, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, at this point, I have one point of they may not like to hear me say is that some of these things are theoretical contraindications, okay? Um, but the ones that are documents have a little reference behind them, like the fourth red bullet down has a 21 behind it. That's a PubMed reference you can go to, okay? In my experience working with patients on anticoagulants, I think that you know, everything that we think is going to affect warfarin really doesn't. I've had people that are on warfarin go on, you know, 30, 30 tablets of Wobenzyme 
and it did not change the INR. So um, here's an example. So some of our concepts about that, we need to back up with lab data. But it's okay to have theoretical concerns, but you know, let's try and get some of the science before we you know, say absolutely no to some of these patients. Again, this is um, one, part, one example. And if you scroll down further interactions, they talk about, again, anticoagulants, but it's the theory again, OK? <laughs> Uh, hypertension is documented, okay? The fourth one down, CNS stimulants is documented, et cetera. So you can go through this website to double check your patient safety, et cetera. So what we find here is we've looked at the specific actions of estoquench and understand that each of these herbs have multiple properties and it's that synergy that's able to um, make these wonderful looking plants um, work good together. So they all interact um, synergistically to reach the goal of aromatase inhibition and also help and maintain your own natural aromatase inhibitors, the androgens, and decrease your aromatase upregulators, the cortisol. So it's a great combination. Um, if you look at this synergy a little closer, though, you're going to notice that there's a line missing. How many of you have seen it? Yeah, already. Ah, there you go. You noticed it. There's not a line going from ester quench at the top the very top in the middle, down to test sequence for women. That line should be erased because uh, ester quench is compatible with every other formula except test sequence for women. All right. So, um, and obviously, different formulas have different compatibilities. As I expand that clinician's guide, we'll talk more about that. But our goal here is not just look at one hormone; look at all of them. So we have to always step back and look at this. Even though today we focus on aromatase inhibition, let's keep in mind. Um, maintaining testosterone function, keeping the cortisol levels down, and then of course let's not forget the um, you know the thyroid as I just mentioned, keeping the cortisol down and, and, and um, the progesterone has to be addressed as well. Keep in mind progesterone is primarily a adrenal hormone. In men it's an absolute adrenal hormone, that's where we get all of ours from. Here's uh, my contact information. You'll notice that the address has changed from the previous webinars. I'm now living out in Sarasota, Florida. I just moved back here this week. My living room is still full of boxes. I'm glad to be back here. And I'm available to any of you. My email is out there for you. My phone number is there. Let's share some cases together. Let's, um, let's change this world, OK? Thank you very much. How was that, Kathleen? That was wonderful information, um, Dr. Collins. We really appreciate you um, being with us. We have some questions coming in. Um, can you explain again why not to use an astrazole to block T2E conversion? OK. Um, some of the non-steroidal aromatase inhibitors, well, besides having lots of side effects, they are not, um, they're not suicide inhibitors. So obviously we have to maintain the levels of those high enough so that they, they're competitive inhibitors, okay? You have competitive aromatase inhibitors versus suicide inhibitors. So when I do have to put it, before I had enough information to give people as to quench and the herbs I've been using now for years, I used to get them on XMS thing to be quite honest, okay? Because it's the, the best in my, I'm not getting endorsements and it's generic now, so I can say that. Um, it seems to be one of the best ways of inhibiting aromatase because it's so close to the natural energy metabolites. Again, the non steroidal metabolites are competitive metabolites. You have to have, they have to compete with estrogen to block aromatase. And that means, you know, get the blood levels up high enough and the wonderful side effects that, you know, these drugs have. Whereas exomestane, the molecule gets inside aromatase. That aromatase is locked until it basically dies. You know, it's that's why I like these steroidal and um, pharmaceutical aromatase inhibitors. If I had a choice, if I had to choose a pharmaceutical, hope I that answers someone, that. I have someone else asking, um, what should the normal PE ratio be? The normal PD ratio, oh gosh, uh, I don't memorize numbers like that anymore because I, I have a little program I wrote in my Excel sheet and everyone sends me labs around the world and the, everyone has different reference ranges. The normal PD ratio, I want everyone to learn how to do it themselves. And how you do that is you basically look at the normal progesterone spread of the normal reference range and the normal estrogen reference range and you divide the, um, 
and you basically like take the um, lowest progesterone divided by the highest estrogen is that's going to tell you the lowest the um, and then you take the um, highest uh, progesterone divided by the lowest estrogen and those will show you what the range will be okay you want the lowest progesterone divided by the highest estrogen will give you one end of the PD ratio and then take the highest estrogen and divide by the lowest um, progesterone will give you the other end of it but before you do that convert to moles because one of the worst things I've seen is some of these laboratories they'll convert you know one of the one, they have estrogen progesterone one of them is in nanograms one of them is in picograms it's like a thousand fold difference and they're just doing P nanogram to picogram ratio analysis by doing exactly what I just told you you know high to low and it's like they're wrong they're absolutely wrong it's 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 embarrassing so look at turn them all to moles and then do PD ratio I think the reason I want to, everyone to learn how to do this themselves because you can do this with anything you can do this with testosterone to estradiol you can add um, you know um, you can say well, what about you know total estrogens I want to take estrone and estradiol and estriol and compare that to testosterone and you know whatever and you can just do all types of amazing stuff once you learn ratio analysis and we're seeing the literature is doing more and more ratio analysis than it was 30 years ago I mean I am excited to see we're doing more of that um, so I'm just gonna on purpose make everyone learn how to do it themselves <laughs> thank you um, another question coming in do you divide the daily doses estroquench or is once daily sufficient on some of the mentioned protocols. Wow, that's an interesting point. Um, this this is a very unique formulation than some of the other ones in that it doesn't have a strong circadian uh, attribute to it. It has a little bit of circadian attribute in that the Ericoma longifolia can raise testosterone and usually you want to take herbs that raise testosterone in the morning. So um, it, it, if the patient finds that if they take the formulation in the evening then um, if they feel like they're disturbing the sleep then they can take it all in the morning and they're still going to get some of the benefit uh, they can spread it throughout the day to get um, you know some of the benefit throughout the day you want to take it with food some of these herbs are they're, well, they're all very strong and on an empty stomach the, they can be a little bit irritating but um, the biggest distinction there is take it in the morning if it causes sleep disturbances otherwise you can spread it throughout the day for convenience uh, some people like to take it in the morning and at night to kind of get like that little, you know, twice a day spread. But then when they're saying, oh, you know, I'm not sleeping as good, at first I thought, well, that's impossible. And they're like, oh, my, I forgot what the Urcoma. So, um, <laughs> so then I say, well, take it all in the morning, and that probably went away. So you can take it twice a day to get the spread, which I know most of us like. But make it once a day if the Urcoma uh, disturbs the sleep. Is that One good? quick question: um, Do you test your patients' hormone, or do you test patients' hormones um, on serum or saliva, and why? I am looking at everything. It depends on the patient. I, um, serum, saliva, urine. I'm starting to look more and more at urine, like um, precision hormones. Um, Dr. Newman's work, um, PhD, uh, because I think we need to pay more attention to metabolites. So traditionally, uh, as many of you know, I've been in the lab industry since the early 90s. I used to own a saliva lab, so I like saliva, obviously, even though I gave all the, um, my share back to the, my co-founder. Um, saliva has its, its, its benefits. I, I use that. I've been using that for decades. Uh, serum gives me more information if I want to look at SHBG. Um, and urine is giving me some information if I want to know tissue response. I'm starting to look more and more at urine tests, even though it's, there's been some good research in it for like 30 years, because what does the body do with this hormone? You know, is it is it actually is it going inside cells and being changed into its metabolite? You know, and you're going to start to see some interesting stuff when we look at the metabolites uh, of um, of uh, the hormones. So at this point in time, I kind of I'm playing with all three of them, depending upon the patient. And let's be honest, part of the reason we choose tests is patients availability to get the tests so when patients have medical insurance that covers serum tests I do very 
expensive serum tests that I can. If they can't afford uh, saliva tests, um, I'm not going to try and push saliva tests on them. If they want saliva tests, I'll give them. Uh, if they want to know 216 ratio, I mean the best test for that is the urine test. So this reminds you of someone asking me, how do I treat menopause? You know, this, so if you ask me, how do I test patients? My answer would be, well, which patient? Okay, it has to be customized to the patient. I don't believe in one size fits all testing, mass marketing of, of tests any more than I believe in one size fits all treatment of menopause or any condition. How's that for a non for a very obscure answer? <laughs> Every patient has different needs, no, obviously. You, yeah. No, thank you, Dr. Collins. I, I think that answers the, all of our questions. Um, we appreciate all the wonderful information you provided today. Um, and we'd also like to thank everyone on the line for joining us. If um, you want to find out more information about EstraQuench or any of the other products mentioned on the webinar today, you can go to douglaslabs.com or you can also email your um, local sales representative. I'd also like um, to remind everyone the recording for this webinar with the slideshow and audio will be available starting tomorrow on our website. And please be sure to keep an eye out for details and information about our next month's webinar. Thank you again, everyone, for attending, and have a wonderful day.